Thank you so much. Thank you for this wonderful invitation to the fifth um, conference, International Conference on Climate Justice. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I was able to listen to the uh, some part of the last presentation, which I was very happy to notice that there is some continuity. There's going to be some continuity between the last presentation and mine. Um, so I was invited to share some insights based on a book I recently published uh, called Climate Justice, uh, Climate Change Justice and Global Resource Commons. And uh, in the little time that we have, uh, I think I believe I have 20 minutes, I will try to present a brief overview of some of the key arguments from that book. And I then would like to share some thoughts on where I'm headed next for my uh, forthcoming research project. And I, I'm going to get, try to capture the notion of decolonizing the resource commons uh, in this particular context, in the context of transformative justice. Um, so um, I thought that a good way in which to um, capture the gist of the main argument or thesis of my book uh, is to present it in the form of this um, uh, graphic. Um, uh, so I... Um, uh, when I started doing research on climate change, um, particularly with a focus on climate justice, um, uh, as a graduate student um, in the in the in 2007, around that time, I completed my dissertation in 2011. So the subject of my analysis at the time was north-south climate justice dimensions, a focus on the international negotiations over the Kyoto Protocol. There were some intense discussions on the Kyoto Protocol, um, whether to extend it, whether to replace it. And as we all know that the Kyoto Protocol has been replaced with the Paris Agreement. Um, so in these uh, sort of discussions, what I came to realize is that these international negotiations are a way in which the international community is trying to, struggling to come up with the rules um, through which the global community should interact to address this problem of climate change. So in that sense, we are treating the atmosphere as a global commons. And as we know from Eleanor Ostrom's work, there are many ways in which at local scale, resource commons can be governed successfully and sustainably uh, through collective action at the grounded scale. Um, and unfortunately, in the international, at the global scale, it has not been as easy to treat the atmospheric um, resource as a commons because of the experience with the Kyoto Protocol, we have not been able to come up with a fair, ambitious, and binding treaty. Uh, the Paris Agreement is not binding and it's not as ambitious and the equity and fairness provisions are uh, quite lacking uh, because the Kyoto Protocol was based on the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities that acknowledged the differential contributions of uh, so-called developed and so-called developing country parties uh, because of the legacy of colonialism, um, but we were not able to come up with an equitable framework to move forward. So uh, what that means is that it has been difficult or challenging to manage the atmosphere as a commons. Uh, so it can seem uh, demoralizing to know that we have, uh, we are at this current state of affairs. And in my book, my argument was that if that has been challenging uh, to manage the atmosphere as a commons, we can still take action uh, and we can still take action within the, uh, 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 within the context of climate justice imperatives. And I propose and I suggest that we do that by supporting numerous efforts around the world at various local national scales to take back various localized resource commons. And um, one of the ways in which that has um, been done um, is in the country of Nepal that I come from. Uh, in Nepal, there is a very successful example of community forestry, uh, which is a way in which local forest users have successfully taken back the forest commons from the nation state and from the wealthy political and economic elite, historically. Uh, and so this kind of uh, model could be emulated for a wide range of other spheres of life that are connected to the um, climate system, whether we think about food based resource and land commons, whether we think about disaster um, response and preparedness, um, whether we think about the technologies that we will need to uh, move to a um, uh, uh, to move towards a, a, a more successful climate mitigation. 
Uh, and when we think about some of the most important uh, climate action we need today, which is to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Uh, I argue that the ability of localized communities to, um, to keep fossil fuels uh, in the ground can be thought of also as an enclosure of the commons. Most communities, um, as we know, do not have the ability to exercise that level of self-determination, but th that should be our effort to support communities to be able to exercise self-determination. So there are other examples in, um, in which localized resources are managed as a commons. Uh, another example comes from the, uh, uh, the example of Hiti, which is uh, a traditional uh, ancient uh, um, mechanism through which water uh, is provided to local communities. Um, so then um, what I um, propose here then is that one of the ways in which we can conceptualize decolonizing the commons is to insist on these, um, these kinds of transformations. Uh, when we think about transformative justice, the, uh, the, the attention seems to be focused on um, structures, economic structures such as capitalism and to, um, uh, to transform capitalism towards a more socialist world is a very honorable goal, um, but can be a daunting one to pursue. Um, in the climate justice and environmental justice literature, there has been a lot of arguments for how uh, we need to focus not only on distributive and participatory justice measures, but on structural change. And structural change is usually conceptualized in the, in the sense of changing the structure of capitalism. But my argument is that we should also be able to conceptualize transformative structural change in the context of supporting local communities um, pursuit of self-determination, self-governance, and autonomy in the pursuit of their sustainable livelihoods. Uh, so this is essential in order to enhance the capabilities of disenfranchised groups and to undo the damage done particularly to indigenous groups by colonization of their resources and territories. If colonialism enclosed the commons and neocolonialism or neoliberalism threatens to privatize it, then decolonization should mean returning the commons to their rightful users. And this works not only in the global or international context, but within very subnational and national contexts as well. So then uh, an argument I am making here is that climate justice um, can be operationalized by supporting various moves to reclaim various commons. Uh, I briefly spoke about the example of uh, community forestry. Um, one of the research projects I engaged in that is uh, also talked about in my book is uh, to think about the impact of uh, carbon trading measures that seek to commodify the atmosphere um, through carbon offsets and such. Uh, I wanted to look at the impact of, uh, uh, you might have heard about Red Plus, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. That is a carbon offset or carbon trading solution that uh, tries to commodify carbon credits. So I wanted to look at the ways in which the Red Plus might affect the successful example of community forestry in Nepal. And what I did see was somewhat troubling. Um, uh, community forestry in Nepal was uh, achieved after great struggle and effort. It was not an easy victory. And it does seem uh, concerning that with the introduction of Red Plus or carbon commodification, uh, it might lead over to possibly weakening the gains of community forestry. Um, and like I was saying earlier, um, there are many different ecological social systems that are connected to the atmospheric system. Um, the struggles with um, commoning versus commodification of forests, water, um, food, and other resources are ongoing. But once again, the effort should be on seeking to uh, keep uh, our resources within the realm of the commons, to preserve the integrity of the commons and to, with, to seek to withstand the pressures to commodify. And there are many examples of uh, thriving, uh, successful commons around the world, which can be supported. And uh, based on these examples, uh, we can also be inspired to uh, engage in more common, com commoning processes. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention here was that in the part of the world where I come from, um, indigenous communities strive to um, retain their sovereignty and self-determination over the forest, 
land and water commons. Therefore, a rallying cry of indigenous activists in Nepal and India is Jal, Jungle and Zameen. That stands for water, forest and, and land, the source of livelihood and, and lives for, for many around the world, particularly for indigenous communities. So then my argument here is that transformative justice should be conceptualized as a way of commoning or reclaiming the commons or taking back the commons to support the autonomy and self-determination of uh, communities around the world. But I um, want to extend that further by saying that uh, taking back the commons is not enough. It is a wonderful start, but it's also important to think about epistemology. Epistemology has to do with the ways in which uh, uh, we, we, uh, we produce knowledge and the ways in which we validate or invalidate various knowledge practices. And, and as the last speaker spoke, um, I noticed uh, there was a mention of epistemic justice. So this is what I am also arguing that transformative justice should um, include not just commoning practices, but also measures to support genuine epistemic uh, justice. And this is a way, uh, a critical and crucial way through which we can decolonize our practices around climate change. Um, so um, the, uh, what I'm saying here is that uh, it is important to govern the commons uh, from the local scale, but also how um, communities get to govern matters as well. So whether communities are able to exercise their traditional practices um, uh, that, that uh, give them con continuity with their ways of living and ways of being um, and ways of knowing. Uh, an argument uh, that I'm seeking to make in my current um, and future work is to show how these three are inherently connected. Uh, ways of knowing having to do with epistemology, ways of being having to do with traditional culture, cultures and worldviews, and ways of living that has to do with traditional practices and rituals. Uh, and here, I think it's also important to recognize that uh, many of those who we deem to be climate vulnerable um, in the climate justice and environmental justice community, marginalized communities, vulnerable communities are oftentimes looked at as victims to be rescued. There is a saviorism element uh, involved in these, um, in these approaches. And I argue that one way in which we can decolonize these efforts is to think about um, the capabilities of traditional communities and what is um, and and what exists in the in the ancient uh, practices and knowledge systems that are increasingly um, becoming erased and weakened and threatened by modernization processes around the world. So to uh, to try to try to help traditional communities um, retain their practices and to to be able to utilize their uh, traditional ways of being and knowing and governing uh, seem to be critical measures in supporting their resilience and their ability to adapt to climate change. And in some cases, uh, as I mentioned with the uh, keeping it in, in the ground, these efforts can also help with climate mitigation as well. Um, so uh, there, in the, uh, in the environmental studies uh, field of study that I uh, usually work within, there is a lot of interest in interdisciplinarity that we have, to, uh, we have to draw on various disciplines and engage in integration among the dis disciplines in order to address the pressing issues of our time, such as climate change. And I, um, uh, I have been thinking about this for quite a while that it's important to not only focus on interdisciplinarity within Western conventions of knowledge production, but also to be open to what I say, what I call inter-epistemic engagement in climate change. So not only thinking about climate change within systems of Western science, climate science, which uh, I'm not saying is not important. It's incredibly important to recognize the validity of climate science, uh, knowing how um, climate denialist forces are at play. Uh, but it's also important to create space for non-Western ways in which many traditional peoples uh, around the world uh, have historically and continue to make sense of climate change. So to try to understand uh, other ways of knowing about climate change is important as well. 
And I asked the question, is there epistemological equity in the work of integrating traditional knowledge and uh, Western Euro Eurocentric climate science? And I think we all know the answer to that question. Um, the IPCC produces reports every couple of years and there is typically a token mention of indigenous knowledge. But what we want to do is to, um, to uh, move towards uh, more meaningful uh, more meaningful ways in which to incorporate traditional knowledge in climate discourse and to uh, seek to validate um, uh, indigenous ecological knowledge and climate epistemologies, not through the lens of uh, Eurocentric science, but on its own terms, so that traditional knowledge um, uh, traditional knowledge, that, and the insights that come from that in the sphere of climate change can be used as a decision-making tool without waiting for scientific validation. Um, um, in, uh, in the field of environmental studies that I work with, there is increasingly um, tremendous interest in incorporating Western science and traditional ecological knowledge. And um, while it is a very desirable and honorable goal, it is not as easy as it seems um, because, of various, uh, uh, because of various reasons. Uh, Foucault have, has talked about the power knowledge, power dynamics, um, um, and this, th this does seem to um, be uh, present in these uh, efforts to integrate Western science and indigenous traditional ecological knowledge. Paul Navan talks about cultural parallax, which is a fundamental inability of people from various vantage points to see one another's points of view. And incommensurability has to do with the ways in which there is a translation challenge bet between different um, points of view or, or worldviews. And this might be possible in the context of our efforts to integrate traditional knowledge and Western science. So I'm arguing that epistemic justice entails considering the legitimacy of traditional knowledge systems for decision making without waiting for scientific validation. Um, Spivak talked about the question of how the subaltern speaks, but whether um, people in positions of, of power are able to hear them uh, or not is a different and more challenging question. So we need, in the context of indigenous knowledge, um, those of us who are in systems of uh, hegemonic knowledge production spaces, such as our universities, we need to make a, a particular effort to try to uh, to validate, legitimize, and try to truly, genuinely understand um, the practices of various um, communities that are uh, grappling with climate change in their own ways. Um, uh, geographer Emily Ye also, um, uh, who um, did some work in interdisciplinary sort of communities in, um, in the context of climate change made these kinds of observations that the efforts to bring them together are wrought by these power dynamics. And among other things, she has argued that it is important to recognize the, uh, the, uh, the embodied practice of traditional indigenous peoples as knowledge and to validate these experiences as knowledge and to use them to understand climate change better. Uh, I would go one step further than the argument that we need to validate the experience of indigenous people. Um, and, and I would argue that many indigenous people, uh, including the one that I belong to, the Newa, as well as um, uh, many others around the world, um, have their own knowledge practices. So beyond, uh, beyond um, collecting their experiences and their observations, I think that we can also be studying uh, uh, even if it's not easy to do within our disciplinary constraints, I think that making an effort to try to make sense of uh, traditional ways of being, knowing, um, and making connections to traditional ways of governing is quite quite critical. In this realm, Linda Dewey Wise Smith, uh, who has published Decolonizing Methodologies, has done tremendous work in showing that uh, there are indigenous uh, practices that. Uh, when you study them closely, have tremendous sophistication and ways of uh, making sense of the place of humans in the cosmos. And these are things that interest me quite a bit. So in my own future research work, as I suggested earlier, I'm, um, my future work is going to be focused on examining indigenous climate epistemologies. And I came up with a framework, I think, that is useful 
in doing this work. So this framework consists of three pieces. One has to do with examining closely the mythologies, the origin stories, prophecies, and other pieces of traditional cultures. And I'm seeking to and proposing to do that. I started to do this for the Newa culture that, that is indigenous to the Kathmandu Valley in current day Nepal. Um, and there are many different stories and uh, stories and epics and uh, um, practices that I uh, uh, think can be encapsulated as um, ways of uh, indigenous ways of knowing. There are also a number of cultural practices related to floods, droughts, and disasters that I argue are very relevant to thinking about climate change and how ancient people historically dealt with these you know, um, weather-related uh, anomalies. Uh, I will very briefly, if there's time, speak about the Machinanath Jatra in this context. Um, so then, uh, also importantly, uh, these indigenous ways of knowing and being are, I argue, connected with indigenous ways of governing, uh, like the Guti institution shows in the context of Kathmandu. The Guti is an indigenous resource management, um, uh, resource governance institution, but it is more than just an institution. It, it's also integral to the identity of the Newa people, and it is under threat today. So in the settler colonial context, um, the, the nation state of Nepal, uh, when the Nepal was created, um, the, uh, the tradition and the institution of Guti has been compromised by the Nepal, uh, Nepali nation state. But um, uh, Guti con uh, continues to, uh, to exist in various uh, more compromised forms. And one of, the, um, one, of the way, uh, one of the realms in which it continues to exist is in the management of these traditional water, uh, water infrastructure that I uh, mentioned earlier. They're called hitis. And they provide water um, within the realm of the commons in the sense that um, uh, you don't have to purchase it, and um, the the infrastructure is um, uh, is increasingly compromised by modern development, such as roads and other infrastructure, city infrastructure. But there is an effort to preserve Hiti as part of heritage con con preservation in Nepal. Um, I, I find that uh, in these sorts of instances, indigenous knowledge and governance is threatening to the nation state but cultural practices being preserved are not as threatening. So in this way, in a compromised way, uh, the practice of Guti has con uh, continued. And there are many other instances in which it continues. But for now, I think this is just one example. So through the, uh, through the sphere of culture, you know, there continues to be the practice of Guti as a resource governance mechanism, which can, I think, be scaled up to be more effectively used as an indigenous governance um, sort of practice. Uh, so one of the other ways in which the Guti comes into play, so then, uh, so these are, so the Machinana Jatra is one of the traditions that are connected to um, uh, praying for rain in a context of drought. Um, and there, there are other traditions such as the Swastani Bratkata, which I think is very interesting because it, it is a older than 16th century practice that, that speaks to the possibility of sea levels rising and engulfing humanity if fossil fuels are dug from the ground. So in, the, in that early era, the idea that these ancient practices already had uh, prophetic um, warnings about climate change is very interesting and important to study and understand. So in conclusion, uh, I would say that climate justice should be thought about um, in, in ways that go beyond simply distributive justice or participatory justice that has been the focus of much discourse. And we really need to think about um, recognizing not just vulnerability and victimhood, but the, uh, but the capabilities and leadership of indigenous communities and various ancient traditional communities in helping us guide the way towards uh, just climate action. And along these lines, uh, recognizing the epi uh, epistemologies of indigenous communities and supporting their ways of governance would um, contribute to moving uh, in the direction of um, transformative justice, transformative climate justice. Thank you very much.